Hello everybody, I am Claire Beresford, your host and CEO of Lawrence Simons, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our latest episode of Summing Up, the legal podcast. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we provide fresh insights to help leaders in the legal industry prepare for and navigate the rapidly changing and evolving business landscape. Today, I'm joined by an incredibly, incredible industry leader who is not a lawyer. We believe that there is value in opening something up to other leaders across the professional services world whose stories will be of interest. With a background in IP and financial technology, I'm delighted to welcome Simon Webster. For over 20 years, Simon has held senior roles at CPA Global, playing a leading role in the transformation from a single product 250 person firm to the industry go-to intellectual property industry platform. During his time leading CPA Global, he doubled the value of the business, reaching over a 5.5 billion sterling valuation and led numerous mergers and acquisitions of businesses across the globe, including CPA Global's merger with Clarivate. Recently, Simon joined Vista as their group CEO, where he leads their global team of 5,000 employees across 47 jurisdictions. His ambition is to double the size of the business and redefine corporate business service category. Alongside this, Simon has until recently been the director of Jersey Bulls Football Club and is the founder and general partner of Shuffle Capital, a venture capital for sleep, health, fitness and leisure. I'm sure our viewers are as keen as I am to learn more about this during our conversation, Simon. What an incredible CV. And we're thrilled to have you here with us today, Simon. Thank you so much. Uh, Delighted to be here. Thank you for asking me. So we always start, Simon, um, rather boringly, really, but we like to start at the beginning um, and ask all of our participants, you know, because every story has a thread which has led them to where they are today. So where was home for you growing up? <clears throat> well, I was born in London a um, long time ago now, back in back in the late 60s, 1969. So, uh, but I didn't actually stay in London long. Well, the family was part, you know, moved out as part of the general kind of move into the burbs that happened during that time. So most of my childhood was in High Wycombe in Buckinghamshire, in and around High Wycombe uh, and, the, and the sort of Chiltern Hills. Uh, I had a brief um, spell in North America, in Rochester, New York, uh, between the ages of 10 and 12, 10 and 13. Uh, But apart from that, it's really been uh, almost exclusively in the Buckinghamshire area. Okay, wonderful. And your time in your time in the US, were you were you schooled there? Yeah, no, I, I, my, my dad worked for Rank Xerox at the time. um, And Xerox Corporation, the parent company was based in, headquartered actually in Rochester, New York. And he just got an opportunity to um, relocate for a few years um, to do a a strategic um, program that they wanted to run. And we went with him. So I, you know, I I left, I was nine years old, just just turning 10 uh, when we left. Um, I, it was a bit of a, I mean, it's one is one of the kind of, I would say, uh, big formative moments for me. I, was um, propelled into the American schooling system um, without wanting to tell too much of a soft story. There is one in there. The um, My parents obviously were very keen for both myself and my older sister to have a good soft landing and, and start well. Uh, they found a place at a lovely private school um, in, uh, in just outside Rochester for my sister. But unfortunately, in my year, there wasn't a space. So uh, I was put on the waiting list and off to kind of normal, um, I would say, you know, straightforward middle school. I went, uh, joined partway through fifth grade. So unfortunately, I didn't start with all of the other kids. They all started in the summer previously. I joined and I came over in the January of uh, 1980, started school partway through the year, kind of putting bowl haircut, Clark's commandos on my feet. I really didn't integrate brilliantly, and it was a tough, you know, it was a tough um, yeah. first year at least. Um, and I was, yeah, I was bullied quite badly, and it was a, you know, a difficult time, I think. But it, 
did it build looking back it built quite a lot of well a lot of resilience it did shape me not that i realized at the time but it did really strengthen me up and, and in fact when when um a space opened up the following year at the private school where my sister was um and my parents said right we've got a space for you they offered me the chance to move i said i'm not going um and my mum said to me why and and, and and I said, because they, they would all think I was a quitter. And that was my response to kind of that sort of first year was I'm just going to dig in. I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to make this work. Um, I didn't, as I say, I wasn't sort of conscious at the time, but it was now a huge part of, you know, my resilience, I think, and my my character was formed during those those years. Fascinating. That That, that is it. It's interesting that resilience, and we'll sort of come on to that later in our in our conversation, if I may. But clearly, it's a it's a real a character trait that that we see in in senior leadership that ability to kind of dig deep and dig and go again and go again. But but I wonder curiously in that sort of educational piece. Um, one of the things I I know about you when I was doing a little bit of of research for this. Um, which I think is particularly relevant for for the lawyers in the legal profession because um, we want to be able to show um, our audience of aspiring lawyers or in the early stages of their career that that perhaps there are different routes to 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 a career and different routes that aren't necessarily about formal tertiary education or or university yeah. education and I I read in your LinkedIn. Um, bio that you you made a, a specific decision not to go to university um, yeah. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about that please yeah so um i i did my a levels um and i i i came back from america and I, I i was lucky enough i took my my 11 plus at the time it's 12 plus now i was in a grammar school area and i ended up in a uh, the royal grammar school in high wickham but i again i came in a year after everyone else and i weirdly you know, I, I was behind in some areas, I was doing okay in others, you know, there was obviously going to be a bit of um, sort of dislocation. And, I, you know, I started out on my and I and I did, you know, I worked initially worked quite hard and then just then just became a kind of teenage boy. And like a lot of teenage boys just didn't really in, in, properly apply myself. And I did I did well at O levels got nine O levels sort of good grades. Um, but um, I didn't really work hard enough, and so when it came, when I did my A levels, and but but sorry, the, the sort of key point here is is that I actually one of these subjects in which I was behind at was maths when I came back over, and and it took it was weird because I was seen as being a, a thicker at maths all the way through school, uh, and then I just got some tuition. My parents got me some tuition going into my O levels actually and and then all of a sudden the light bulb came on for me with maths it was weird it was a uh, the maths the, 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 the tutor was a t- was the parent of a boy in my class who was very good at maths and he was a rector at a local church and he was a brilliant maths tutor and it just turned the light on for me and I and I did very well at maths at O level we, you know all of us shocked everyone really I, I in my mock I think I've got 96 percent and in my I only got a B unfortunately at O level but it was still you know, way better than anyone would have expected me to get. But I, but the die was cast a bit, and I chose my A levels around the subjects which I'd found. You know, I'd been doing previously. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. My mum was a linguist, my sister was a linguist, so I chose French, German, and economics. Hated French and German, um, loved economics, and actually, when it, when but, but but the kind of key point to it is, as I was playing football uh, in the pupils versus faculty teachers game at the end of the year at Bisham Abbey and I snapped my cruciate ligament in that game and as soon as I finished my A-levels I went into a plaster cast non-weight bearing you know just completely sort of immobile that's how they used to do it back then and um, you know told my parents uh, that you know there was no chance I was going to be going to university with this big cast on my leg um that would have been you know ruined my first year etc et so or, or whatever the kind of i can't remember exactly remember how the conversation went but yeah it was agreed um and so but they said well you're going to get a job so i went and got a job and uh, up in london um and it was a you know not it was collecting unsecured subprime credit subprime credit it was a you know it was a pretty gritty job for an 18 year old 18 19 year old and i, I went up on my crutches you know 
uh, got, got the job on my. And it got, I went to an interview on my crutches up to Victoria from leafy Buckinghamshire. I think that was one of the reasons he gave it to me. Actually, he was so impressed that I'd hobbled up there on my own. Um, and you know, I, I loved it. I loved the job. And um, and when it came time to sort of reconsider going to university and so on, I told my parents I didn't want to. I was enjoying work. I was. I was loving traveling up to London with my briefcase with just my sandwiches in it. I loved being part of the whole scene. And consequently, I, I decided, we, we, you know, much to, I think, their annoyance and so on, I decided, you know, we decided I'd carry on working. And I, and I did well. I, you know, I was kind of progressing through, largely through luck, but also just being, you know, making sure I could take advantage of the luck when it, when it arose. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I, I guess the sort of you know the, the final point on it was that I did recognise that I needed to do something to uh, progress my um, you know make sure that my career wasn't held back by the by the fact that I didn't go to university. This was pre the days when you know this was pre Tony Blair when the university system was opened up. You know re, you know my, my mother was the first person in her family to go to university. Um, and so, you know, it was still relatively restricted at that point anyway, mm-hmm. but, but nevertheless, it was going to be a factor. And, and so what I, I talked to a mentor, um, who, who I was working with, working for, and he, he said, well, be in, become an accountant, you know, you can train to be an accountant, um, while you're working. And, and I was thinking, oh my God, yeah, but, but that's very mathsy. And as it turned out, you know, I, I just basically sailed through all the exams, passed first time, uh, found it very strong, and, and have just learned to love maths. So it is a weird one. I'd say there's a few few lessons in there. You you may not be the things that you're you love and you you're good at may not be as evident as they could be mm-hmm. as you're coming through your schooling years. So you know uh, they certainly weren't for me. And even though in the end it obviously worked out well, there are many paths to to take. Uh, before you get to, you know, a fully formed uh, version of yourself, you know, in in in, a, in terms of a career. So yeah, so that's really the backstory. Um, I've told it a few times. People people do. I mean, there's a, there's a, a lot of funny other funny things along the way, which I won't share with you now. But um, you know, it, it is a it it is it is I think a very important part of you know it's it's made me who I am. Again, it's sort of additive to that um, sort of core. Uh, of of who I am is are, are those decisions or things that happen to me along the way and sort of move me in certain directions. It it's interesting, isn't it, that if you if you you take the fact that you didn't think maths, you were good at it, right? You didn't think that you had that skill set, and then you were sort of in an in in spite of yourself almost because of your parents being, you know, active and, and and good parents who were encouraging and all of those things and okay, let's let's give this a go, let's try it, that you find yourself in in a period of time where actually we're moving towards information technology, we're moving towards, you know, uh, computers, computerizing yeah. things and 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 that job, that role that you were you were speaking about, you know, on your crutches when you're when you're 18 or 19. And um, there was obviously something in you that was like, oh, we can we can make this better. We can improve this. We can innovate. We can. Yeah, I, I, I was kind of lucky on that because I arrived, I sort of arrived on the scene just as the the sort of personal computer revolution was was coming, was was becoming sort of more mainstream. So prior to that point and actually, you know, when I arrived, it was all mainframes, green screens and mainframes. So you access, there was one big computer humming away somewhere inside the building. There was no internet. Uh, there was no network, um, no mobile phones or anything like that. You just basically, um, you know, worked on a mainframe computer. Um, but PCs were starting to appear on the ends of desks. They weren't networked at this point, but they did have applications on them like Lotus 123 and Paradox uh, databases and so on. And I was fascinated by this. I mean, I, I've always been, you know, fascinated by it. I had a Commodore 64. I used to do programming on that. I used to, you know, I, I loved it all. And so when they arrived at the workplace, I was the first one on there sort of messing around and self-teaching and and get and ultimately, you know, because I think when you show aptitude mm. uh, for something, then you're, you're in, and passion for it, your employer is much more likely to invest into you for that. Um so I was able to persuade them to give me training courses on 
spreadsheets and and databases and so on. And and as a result, you know, this was this was a, a period where you could you could actually create masses amounts of value just by just by creating a spreadsheet. Um, it was I mean, it sounds ridiculous now because spreadsheets run the world, but um, back then it was kind of totally revolutionary and. And, and I was lucky because I found myself in that spot and I was able then to use like data and, you know, in a progressively bigger way, bigger and bigger way, use data and and technology to solve, you know, fairly sizable problems uh, inside the organizations I work for and, and sort of built this career around really operational change, operational improvement, operational change. Um, founded on, on you know, combining that with the kind of accountancy, management accountancy is really all about um, understanding what's going on and making good decisions on that. So, you know, you can see how combining the ability to understand what's to, to get the data and manipulate the data and analyze it and put it into forms that people can use and then apply, you know, my my training and my knowledge to that, you know, it was an ex- really was a huge accelerant to my early career and put me in put me in the position, put, you know, that frankly put me in the position that resulted in me really moving forward, um, you know, to the to the point where I became, ultimately became the CEO of a global business. Mm. It's interesting, you mentioned right at the beginning of that, a mentor, you mentioned sort of that, and, and if we can sort of touch on leadership, because you, 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 you know, you said you, that because of that, you were able to sort of accelerate your career and, 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 you know, you can see that you, that you were relatively early, early in terms of age. I'm not necessarily yeah. talking about experience now, but in, if, if what you have in the legal profession, you, you tended to have this lockstep. You know, it was you've got to have had and in accountancy as well. Right. You've got to have had X years experience before you get to be senior associate. You've got to have Y years of experience before you're a junior partner and so on and so forth. What's interesting, I think, about your career, Simon, is that that was sort of, you know, rocket fueled into senior leadership relatively early on so two questions really the first one is what what was leadership like when you first joined some of those businesses and what lessons did you take from that when you were in leadership positions if anything Uh, that's a great question so my first um my first few sort of managers or leaders were were just men they were men for a start and they were um they were um what you'd expect really but they were good they were good at what they did um they were good decision makers they were analytical um they were supportive i was very lucky you know even my first <laughs> my first manager a guy called alan barnes who you know who was he he had a soft spot for me no doubt partly because i was doing some interesting things to help and being innovative um and he was very sad when i said i was going he actually on my leaving card he just wrote in big red pen traitor and it looked like blood (laughs) but um he was a great he was a very i didn't realize at the time but he was a very good sort of first manager he just gave me you know the the, you know helped me to understand discipline and and not a discipline in in personal discipline let's say in terms of work because that first step from you know not being a, a, a an employee to being an employee is actually a really important one just for behavior and sort of understanding what's happening to you you know, if you, that in some ways, the mentorship that you receive at that transition point is probably going to make a disproportionately big difference to how successful you are going forward. Um, and I think a lot of people don't realise that. You know, that, and but when it's almost things get set almost at that point, which is then very hard to shake off. But he was a, you know, I got very, I got great sort of early mentorship. Then my second boss was. Um, you know, was an was an accountant. He was the one that said you should be an accountant, and um, he was a super smart guy. He was he was smart because he was he was problem oriented. So he he didn't he didn't sort of he wasn't just sort of what do I do? You know, what he was one of these people that was able to look at something and and look at it from all sorts of angles and and sort of come up with you know really insightful. Um, perspectives and then obviously solutions on that and I learned a lot from that he was he was you know very very helpful but then I I then had fortunately for me I then had a couple of women who were my boss Um, and you know that brought a different um, kind of um, leadership style and leadership approach Um, you know it was 
it, it, and, and was helpful for me at the time. It, it made me, it stopped me from becoming some sort of, you know, male oriented leader and, and sort of rounded out my, my kind of perspective on how, you know, how to get things done and how to get people to get things done and so on. Um, I think, and I think, but you know, those those early days. This was a sort of early late eighties, early nineties, or up to the mid nineties, were you know that that was a period of um, you know it was quite an interesting period. There weren't there wasn't anything like the discourse that there is today on mm-hmm. leadership and management. <laughs> Nothing like it. And yet, having said that, there were some outstanding people um, who who were obviously just you know good people, um, kind people. Yeah. Uh, passionate people and you know took, took their jobs very seriously and and you know like to see others succeed and I, again I mean it's I'll, they, those things are called level five leaders now you know that's what yeah, that's how they get described but actually I was just lucky to have a succession of people who were like that before it was described like that uh, to help me along the way. It's interesting because I mentorship is really vital and um, but so is it's its cousin, which is sponsorship, right? And having those people in an organization who really have those protégés, right? And it sounds to me that there was, at each stage of that career, there was somebody who put you into a room or said, Simon could do this. Or, you know, when hands were being put up, they they perhaps volunteered you or co-opted you. Yeah. Or, because I, I, I think that there's a role in life now in terms of that leadership responsibility where you're looking at talent and how talent can come through. And sometimes it's 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 um, figuratively wrapping arms around people to say, you've got this, come on. I, I, yeah. I, can, I can spot that in you. So somebody at some point, Simon, spotted something in you that perhaps you haven't spotted in yourself. No, very true. To say? Yeah, no, very true. I mean, actually, sponsorship is, uh, is I'm, that's, I'm glad you say that. It's one of the things that I do also talk about. Um, if you think about what sponsorship is, when we, when we think of sponsorship, we often think of a sponsored walk or, you know, sort of someone has set an objective and they're asking you to sponsor them for that objective, for, often for raising money. What they're actually asking you to do is take a risk on them, you know, take a, take a punt on them that they're going to deliver on what they've said they're going to deliver and you're, you're putting, I mean, it's not really a risk because the money goes to charity, but that's effectively what sponsorship is. Mm-hmm. So if you want to be, you people, you, you, need the, you need the person who's prepared to sponsor one, um, which is the kind of kindness and generosity point. But you also need to, uh, to a certain degree, you need to earn that sponsor, that right to be sponsored. You need to be prepared to set your ambition, I mean, on reflection, you need to show your ambition. You need to demonstrate that you've got the, you know, you've got the drive and determination to get there and, and that by sponsoring you, the, the that individual is not going to make themselves look stupid. And I, and I you know, it, it sounds harsh, but that's the reality of it. You know, mm-hmm. people, you know, if you if you are looking for someone to sponsor you, you can't you can't just ask them. Well, you can. I mean, I suppose that's one way of doing it in, 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 in work. But actually demonstrating that you are someone that, you know, deserves to be given a little bit more of a of a sort of. Um, help is the wrong word, but sort of, you know, support um, along your journey is a key part. Of it. Um, and, and it and it can be frustrating because sometimes you do that and you still don't get sponsored. And, and unfortunately, that's kind of, you've got to have those two ingredients of the right individual and, and you putting yourself in a position where you've kind of earned that right. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, that, should, that doesn't mean, you know, the, the alternative is not, is not to do that. And, you know, I can pretty much guarantee you won't get that sponsorship if you're in that position. So, so I think you know, I'm a big believer in 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 sort of encouraging sponsorship amongst leadership teams. You know, making it part of what makes them a leader. Um, you know, what it is to be a leader at, at the organisations I I work in, and and you know, for, for individuals when I talk to them is to say, you know, this is your chance. You know, you, you give yourself every chance to be to be supported and progressed. I'd like to talk about Vistra, um, yeah. if, if I may, uh, because first of all, congratulations. I know you're re- relatively new to, to that role. Um, yeah. You've got 5,000 employees in over 47 different jurisdictions. Now let's talk about what leadership looks like there. Because yeah. that's, that's quite a 
That's quite a task, right? Well, it's, it's very interesting, actually. I was just chatting with um, Calum there before I'm um, giving a bit of a shout out there to Calum. Um, uh, just chatting with him before we came on, just on the sound check, on the video and sound check. And, you know, I've spent my afternoon, I, I, you mentioned earlier on, I've got a VC that I founded a few years ago, a venture capital business that invests in a very early stage businesses in sleep, health, fitness and leisure. And one of those businesses has asked me um, to run a culture day for them, not really knowing what they meant by that, what, they, what they're looking for. They're about to go from being the founder team to a bigger group, so or they already have. but So they've got employees or colleagues now as opposed to it being just the founding team. Where, and there is a difference there. You, you know, the founding team will always have a, you know, innate passion and, you know, everything for the, for the project. Uh, and and for the for, when you start to broaden the organisation, you know the idea the ideal should be that you try and infuse and and grow that passion. So they've asked me to to help them get started on that journey, and I um, so I spent the afternoon actually. I set it aside in my calendar, and I've been putting together a, a day. Um, you know, uh, and we can't achieve everything, so it's a foundational day for them that they can then build on themselves. And I said to Caleb, you know. The interesting thing is that that's been great fun for me to do that, sort of going back a little bit. Um, but ultimately, you know, the the, 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 the the topics are the same, whether it's 5,000 people or five five people. You know, you are you are looking to inspire, you know, for, as, as a CEO, there's not much I can do, um, actually do in terms of the job. I mean, I can't program things anymore. It's way beyond me. Um mm-hmm. You know, I, I, you know I, I, there's very little I can do. What, what I can focus on is are, are sort of, I would say, some just key things. And right at the top of that list is kind of aligning the organisation and mobilising uh, mobilizing through, through the leadership. Um, and, and actually, it's, it, the, 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 the fundamental things are not that different. You know, determine, you know making sure that we have a, an, ins, an inspirational... Um, narrative really running through the business that sort of stems from culture, but uh, sorry, stems from purpose, but but sort of um, is a narrative that we that we can really own and and believe in and you know drive towards as an organisation uh, that can contextualise all of the decisions that people may make day in day out, and that, so that we make. If we make 80% good decisions today, then hopefully after this we'll make 90% good decisions. And those are that's where the magic happens in big organizations. It's it's you know, if you think um, if you can have an impact, if you by me doing this culture day, I'm probably gonna have an impact. Be able, my, the work I do can have an impact on uh, probably 10 people. You know, by doing so by working on these things at Vistra, you know, I can have the same impact potentially on five thousand people. And actually, we're we're doing a merger at the moment where that's going to go up to closer to ten. So we're so you know it's a but fund, at its heart, it's fundamentally the same things. It's weird. Um, the, the the apparatus by which it happens is different. You know the scale, the complexity, the kind of uh, navigating of of cultural uh, differences and norms is is obviously makes it more complex. But ultimately, your 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 you know your your goal is to is to galvanise a, a, a group of people around a common outcome, uh, and in, give them what they need to be successful, and incentivise them to do so. That's that's fundamentally what it's all about, and it and it and that doesn't change really. <laughs> I mean, that's whether you're whether it's a football team, um, whether it's a you know whether it's a team in in the um, sleep. This actually is a medicinal cannabis uh, business, a pharmaceutical cannabis business. But weirdly, you know, um, it takes all sorts. Um, but it, it, it could be a ten-person team, a sort of eleven-person football team, or a ten-thousand global team. Ultimately, it is about you know galvanising that group of people around a common outcome, um, you know, and giving them what they need to be successful, and incentivising them to do it, or motivating them to do it. I should say, not just incentivising, motivating. Yeah, it's a, it's a great answer, and and I know also at Vistra you talk about doing the right thing. Um, and one of the five pledges that you have as a business that you've made is around diversity, equity and inclusion. And you just mentioned in your in your previous answer, Simon, about, you know, there is a difference sometimes in culture. There's a difference in, in, in potentially where you are in the world. So D&I means different things 
sort of depending where you are in the world and yours is a, is a global business. So how do you manage that at Vistra? Yeah, it's a, it, it is. This this is a fascinating topic. OK, so we, we are, you know, one of the things about um, running global businesses is it's it's pretty confronting around values and culture um, now, because because it is in, it is incredibly arrogant for a Western male to 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 assume that he knows anything about um, Asian culture and what is motivational for Asian people, how they think about the world, what they you know, they're, they're, and they are completely different. You know, uh, you know, and I would I you know I could we could do another entire podcast on that. Um, but it, but it's you know I I could not possibly begin to do that and but but what you, what I do have to be is you know as we set out the common purpose for our organisation the reason why we come together as a group of people you know if that if this purpose didn't exist then there's no point for us to aggregate into five thousand people all sort of trying to do something together um, as we set about that we have to be you know we have to be very respectful of of those different cultures so the first thing is be respectful so in terms of um you know diversity the, the most powerful thing is is knowledge and education right so before any actions before you take because because you can take actions that you think are you know for, for diversity uh, and inclusion uh, and equity you can take actions that you think are that are based on your own sort of cultural perceptions, which you think are perfectly reasonable, and they won't be for someone else in the world. So you have to start with knowledge and education. You have to be, um, you know, you have to. I, I, I couldn't, I can't overemphasize that because you know, I've made mistakes that that you know that have you know taught me the hard way on this. Then there's the actions. What action do you take? So, so then you. So once you once you're in a position where you where you are being fully respect, you have knowledge and you're being respectful of the sort of other cultural and and sort of uh, groupings that you have within your organisation. Then it's about taking actions which are um, which are appropriate uh, for your business. So you should never be doing something that's not appropriate for your business. Your business is your business. Its primary purpose, unless it is, is not to solve the world's, um, you know, inequality issues. It's mm-hmm. not that sort of primary purpose. So as it goes around its primary purpose, you know, you have you should be making decisions and taking actions that, you know, that are um, that that do do that. You know, that support that. That are never counter to that. Um, that that are and where you can make a difference. Uh, and and it's and it's um, sympathetic to your organisation's purpose, then you should do so. Yeah, uh, you know, there's a great responsibility that goes with leadership um, of, of big organisations, and that is that they can have big impact. You can have big impacts, probably even more so than governments in lots of ways, um, because of the way the organisation projects onto the world and what it does. Each organ an organisation of five thousand people probably has a customer client base of potentially two million, three million people. Um, so it projects what it does and how it thinks as an organization onto a much bigger population. Clearly, the people inside your organization are far more exposed to that. So the impacts you can have are very big. Um, and, and, and you cast, and as leaders also, the other thing I'll say, as leaders, you, ca- you cast a shadow much longer than you can ever imagine. The more senior you are, the, more, the longer that shadow is. And uh, you're all, people are always looking at you. You know, they are always... Uh, they're always looking to follow your, or certainly to sort of see what you're doing and, mm-hmm. and you know, determine what your attitude is to something, you know, from your actions and from what you do. So as individual leaders and, as, and, and, as, and, and in terms of how you set up your organisation, you know, my, don't, don't, my sort of message is knowledge, knowledge and, um, and education first. Then, in terms of taking actions, every opportunity you can take to address um, diversity and inclusion that is not at odds with your company's purpose, uh, then you should, you know, you should a- attempt to do that. It's not always easy. You'll have to align stakeholders, and you know, sometimes that, that can be challenging. Again, cultural norms come into play here. Um, you know, we have offices in 47 countries you can imagine the difference of opinions there are around some of the things that we regard we've got pride month this month 
in, in the UK. Mm-hmm. And you can imagine the difference of opinions that there are across many of our offices about, you know, those very topics. So it's a, it's a, it's a tricky subject to, uh, you know, it's a tricky, it's not a tricky subject. So you have to be very respectful. You have to be very careful uh, in terms of not, you know, othering people, you know, just because, you know, that you don't, yeah. that you, that you agree with you, pers- your personal views, um, but also look to, you know, bring them, bring those people up and bring them forward uh, where they are disadvantaged or where they do have, you know, um, barriers uh, that are, you know, that can slow their progress, un- uh, you know, uh, and, or lack of opportunities. I mean, it is a big answer, but it's also a very, very big subject. And it and it just, it, it requires kind of, as I say, the most important thing is to, is to think very, very clearly and carefully about the, about about what you are doing. Thank you. That I, I I agree with you that it could be a podcast in its own right. It is something that, um, you know, we we take very seriously as an organisation because obviously in in our world we're being asked and when we get a mandate from a client, the diversity of the slate is always something that we have discussions on and around. Um, but to your point, that diversity isn't isn't a one size fits all and it isn't it isn't just gender or 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 sexuality you know there's, there's social mobility within diversity there's there's all kinds of things that that are that are important that organizations need need to look at well look, well, the, the, the thing is as well organizations are at their best i mean you know I sort of people say, what do you, you know, what do you do? You know, what is, what is the job of the CEO? And it's just built, you know, in the, in the kind of area that I'm in, it's just building great organizations and building a great organizations are, you know, great places to work, uh, do great things and create huge amounts of value for their clients. And they um, generate significant value for their shareholders and they make a big impact on the world around them. Those are, that's what, in my definition of, you know, this sort of four stakeholder groups to an organization like ours there are clients, there are um, colleagues, there are shareholders typically, and then there's the world at large. Mm-hmm. And, you know, those which and, and those four kind of stakeholder groups I think about in terms of clients is kind of brand. How do they feel about us? Uh, you know, as an organisation, there's with our colleagues. It's culture. How do they feel about us? And how are we as an organisation with them? Um, with shareholders, it's often sort of strategy. Uh, you know, what, how are we delivering value for them? How are we helping them to live, to meet their client needs? And then the fourth, the world around us, around us is purpose. You know, that's that's our impact on the on the world around us. Now, if you if you so measuring progress against each of those four sort of sort of vectors, including purpose, it, you know, you you can I think you can. Building a great organisation, therefore, is going. You know, diversity in all its forms is going to make a, a better organisation. If you think about across all those, all those things, culture. You know, you think about uh, brand and brand messaging. You think about purpose and the impact we can have in uh, areas of the world. All of those things are served by diversity and in, obviously in inclusion. So. You know, it is a it is a truly you know very powerful component of building a great organisation. Um, as I say, the only thing I would say is just don't don't have a closed mind, don't have a sort of mm. blinkered mindset about what it means because you'll be wrong. And it's interesting, isn't it? Um, how the that ability to keep that open viewpoint, that ability to to get curious around well tell me what it's like in your in your country tell me what it's like you know um always be able to um listen and really hear what is being said i think is is one of the key skills of of, of great leadership right it's it's sometimes yeah. seeing what hasn't been asked in the room or, or what hasn't been said it's sometimes just as important as as what has been said um Absolutely. well that's the knowledge that's what you mean by knowledge and education for me is you know Take the time to understand the, the you know the real picture here. You're resp- you know as a lead, as, as a CEO, I'm responsible today for five thousand plus people's professional careers. You know that's a really that's a massive responsibility. You know, but I'm responsible for all of them, not just the ones that I, I agree with culturally or you know I'm responsible yeah. for all of them. And yeah. you know that's kind of the point, isn't it? You've got to you, that that is diversity. It's diversity. You know, in its truest form, and and so you know, 
leaders, as you, I mean, careers progress differently. And maybe sometimes you'll, you know, these days less likely, but sometimes people are going to be in careers, which are going to keep them within a very sort of narrow, you know, worldview. And, you know, maybe that worldview is very similar to the one that they have. And, and you know, life will fe- feel very comfortable to them. Um, but increasingly, and especially those, you know, people who are listening uh, or watching who are interested in a global career where they're interacting with people in many different countries, whether as clients or colleagues or whatever they are, um, you know, you, that's, you, you need to then, that, that's the point at which getting a real kind of sense as to how to make the right kind of impact on the world becomes so important. As we look forward, right, as we look forward to what, what are we, what are we living with? What, how are we adapting as human beings? The, the sort of the, the topic that is on everybody's um, agenda today across all businesses, artificial intelligence, machine learning, call it what you will, but we're seeing it within the, the legal industry. Um, and we know this is the same across many sectors. Curious to understand for you, Simon, in, and in your world, how is it impacting the businesses you are working with, your, your, you in, in your business or, or your clients? And, um, you know, you've, you've always been at the forefront of some of this innovation and, and change throughout your career. So what yeah. are you seeing today? Well, I mean, at the moment, I would say we're not, we're not actually seeing a lot yet, Um uh, you know, there's a lot of talk and, you know, there, there was probably, you know, there, there will almost certainly be quite a lot of work going on, um, but, but we're not seeing it yet. It's not actually sort of, I mean, we've got the, 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 the industry I'm in really has kind of um, sort of automation and bots, but it's actually, you know, a, a an industry that's grown up very quickly of late, sort of scaled quite quickly. So the big players have you know, they're sort of, um, they're big, but they're kind of adolescent, really, in terms of maturity. And so the digital maturity is relatively low compared to some of the other industries like legal and and um, sort of more the more kind of traditional fintech areas. Um, but, but you know, the, the, the big topic, it is a big topic, you know, it's as big as the internet, but it's going to actually happen a lot faster than the internet happens, because the internet is a, is a castle, you know, a fuel for it. Uh, it's a, it's a, it creates far greater access. So the thing so, so it's so for a for the for a CEO or a leader of a business, the big thing at the moment is understanding what is the risk to my business from this, uh, rather than what is the opportunity. Now, the two are two. You know, I see two halves two halves of the same whole. You know, we, by understanding the risk, what could AI, you know, disrupt in yeah. our in our industry and in our company, also represents something an opportunity for us to get ahead of that. Um, you know, I'm on the back. I am on the. I'm on the. I'm in the camp of AI, generative AI being a uh, an augmentation rather than a replacement technology. Um, there are some areas where it will replace, but I think for a lot of what um, account because my business is a lot of accountants in my business. My business basically is a, you know, it's effectively a kind of a. It's, it's, it's big parts of it are based on accounting. Um, some of it's on sort of legal, quasi legal, company secretarial, and so on. Mm-hmm. So there, there, and you know, there are certainly today, and I think for a long time, the regulatory side of our business, the regulators will want you know substance, not just in terms of geographic substance, but also human substance in the work that we do, and that's a good thing. I think that is a moat uh, around jobs and and expertise uh, that will help us to sort of um, manage the change that's coming at us a little bit more slowly and carefully. But but so so what we're focusing on as an organisation is understanding, you know, the potential disruptive risk to the services that we provide today. I'm very, you know, I'm thinking about it first and foremost as a, as a sort of not how can we take advantage of this, but, you know, how might this hit us and change us? And, and, you know, how, how might our clients demand that, Mm -hmm we do things differently uh, and what implications will that have for us as as people inside our business our ways of working the way we the way we work and so on um, but but at the same time you know as I say these we, we you have to be forward-looking it can't always be about risk so the, the the flip side of that will be to say where can we augment some of the things that are today sort of frankly so holding us back so for example we looked at a bit of technology recently uh, which 
sort of acts as an internal AI. Um, so you, you, it, it, you, it's not a chat GPT or anything. It's inside your organization. Uh, it is more like machine learning than AI, but it does have sort of AI type, a generative AI type um, or large language model type features to it. And, and what you do is you sort of, um, you put it on top of your internal database. And, you know, if you're responding to a question from a client, the the user can can query, can ask, can chat with the AI, asking a question, basically cutting and pasting the client's question. And the AI will not only be able to identify the documents or area of things inside your database, and they might be laws, they might be rules, they might be regulations. It will identify the relevant ones and and um, you know and reference them in the answer, and then provide a summary answer that you can that, you know provided it's sensible and makes sense, you can cut and paste back into the email. Now that what that that the, the, the expert piece of that is still going to take place because of the review that's being taken by the expert, but the dull bit of going and finding all the details and referencing all the documents has been done for them. Mm-hmm. So there are some areas where we see opportunities for augmentation. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very hot topic, obviously. I'd like to change gears a little bit now, if I may, and, and talk to you about your other um, day job. <laughs> um, and we recently learned, well, we, we, we've chosen at Lawrence Simons to shift our language a little bit around um, uh, mental health. And we choose to use the term mental fitness because we view it very much as an active um, participative um, something that consistently needs to be worked on, like physical fitness, right? It's not a static thing. Um, and it needs to be have a daily practice to it. Um, Your venture capital business, Shuffle, invests in happiness and supports organisations, as you said, in their sleep, health, fitness and leisure sectors. I'd like to know what drove you to set that up, Simon, and and, and, and can you tell us a little bit more about it, please? Absolutely, yeah. So it was... um... Uh, around 2009, sort of partway, halfway through my time here in, you know, CPA in Jersey, I I suffered a kind of a mental health crisis um, brought on by a life change, um, life changing event. And I, uh, you know, I struggled to, you know, I kept going to work. I, I sort of, but I was really struggling and it was horrible. It was a horrible experience and I did everything I could to try and overcome it. It was really anxiety, mainly anxiety and insomnia for me. Um, and eventually just through doing all sorts of different things, acupuncture and, uh, you know, CBT, um, mm-hmm. boiling banana skins, all sorts of things. Uh, I, I got over it. it took, well, it took a while, exercise, fitness training, help, you know, very extensive fitness training. I did get over it. And I, and I, you know, and I sort of, to myself, I made the promise to myself that I, when I finished work, I would, that I'd go and help others in that situation. Well, I did finish work. When I sold CPA, I thought that was it. I thought I was going to be retired forever. Um, and I founded the VC, really, with the, rather than sort of just, I mean, going and working for a charity or, or being a counsellor myself, I thought, how can I actually do this at scale? How can I have a big impact? Mm-hmm. Um, so I founded the, the business. I decided, came up with the idea of, 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 of a venture capital business that invested in companies that were working on solutions, really, for... <laughs> primarily sleep and mental health, um, but sort of a bit broader than that, um, covering, as you say, wellness, um, sort of preventative wellness. So the spectrum really is, as you say, preventative wellness and, and you know, um, and mental health uh, remedies, uh, including um, especially in the area of sleep, which we have a real passion for. Um, so that was how it came about. And, um, you know, we... we we're still, you know, we're just about to raise up. We've just started fundraising for our first fund, our first external fund, which is hugely exciting. Two of the guys that I work with at CPA, one of whom you probably remember, Claire, uh, are working with me on that. <coughs> Two of the smartest guys I've ever met, actually. So, you know, thrilled to be doing it and uh, really excited about what we can do there. Oh, that, that's fantastic. Genuinely, I think if the world had more... Um, entrepreneurs in that way who 
bring it right back to the beginning you understood maths you understood you then did accountancy you you yeah. know you, you you understand that world and understand that money is actually just an energy it's a tool it's a tool that allows you to to have impact so yes exactly yeah no exactly right that's that's the way i saw it and um you know are you as you rightly say the the kind of the goal is, you know, we, there's an epidemic going on, particularly in mental. There's a mental health epidemic. I mean, if, if you measured the number of people that have mental health issues, diagnosed mental health issues, being treated today, often through drug therapy, and you held that up against, let's say, uh, COVID nineteen or influenza or any of the other, we've got. Sorry, it's not an epidemic; it's a pandemic. We have got a we've got a pandemic of mental health issues. And yes, there is a lot of money goes into it, of course, but it's almost all drugs. Um, it, there are some new therapies coming out which are which are helpful, but you know, um, you know, there, there's more needed in this area, way more needed in this area. Um, you know, we are, you know, we're a long way away from the kinds of solutions that we need to to get this under control. So it's very clear to me, Simon, that you, you know, you've invested in your physical and mental. Uh, fitness and, and well-being so you know you're also now the CEO of a, a global in, you know organization how do you ensure that you keep a good routine um I, actually I don't I'm, I'm, one of the things that has suffered a bit recently is routine and it, and actually that is the key is routine um it's rut routine is very important for sleep it's called sleep hygiene but it bas basically it's routine Get your, you know, and it's following the right routine as well, not just the wrong routine, like have a gallon of alcohol before bed. That's the wrong routine. The right routine is, you know, it, and stick with that routine. Same with exercise and fitness. You know, your body, uh, you know, the training effect arises when you, you know, train regularly um, and, and you know, continue to sort of push your body a little bit more each time. That's how you get kind of physical fitness. Um so, so it is, it, you know, I, when people say to me, ask me, what, give me one way to sleep better. I just say, prioritize sleep. Mm. That's, that's actually all you need to do oftentimes is prioritize it. And what does prioritize sleep mean? It means, no, after work, don't go for a drink. Go home and prioritize sleep. It means don't eat late. Go out, you know, if you, if you get asked out for a a meal with a friend and you, you quite fancy it but you're feeling very tired say no and prioritize sleep you know you can't have both you can't have it always and the only way on often that people are sleeping badly or sleep better is if they prioritize it and they do the they, they go without some of the things that are in their life today for the benefit of better sleep and i absolutely 100 percent guarantee them that if they do that they will be happier than if they've done the things that they think are making them happy, but are stopping them from sleeping. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, you know, Shuffle is about investing in happiness, because ultimately, you know, the, the most basic foundation for being happy is sleep. There is nothing more important. It, it's Pretty interesting, isn't it? A little sermon finished on that, so but I will tell <laughs> everyone and anyone I can, because I, I want the world to sleep better. We, we forget, don't we? We forget as adults what we knew as children, right? If, you, if children, their capacity to sleep, their understanding that they need sleep, their ability just to take sleep, right, is, is, is how they can grow and be active. You know, you, you literally see it amongst... Well, I'll tell you something else there. The, the interesting thing about sleep as well, it's self-defeating because unlike... Um, exercise or nutritional diet where we are conscious about what we are doing you know we are there in the moment doing that thing exercising eating correctly or whatever the problem with sleep is we're unconscious when it's happening and so it's very hard for us to we, it doesn't have the same presence in our minds as an active activity it's almost self-defeating like that. And, and that's why you have to put it first. It can't go second, third or fourth. It has to go first because it will sleep will become the thing that you do with last unless you do it first. But you're right. I think as kids, and my son is a great sleeper, but partly because we made sure he is. Um, you know, we did the things that will, you know, we, we made, you know, we, we, we did the things that we felt. It's not always right for everybody, so I'm not going to give a I'm not going to give a sermon about how to get your child to sleep better. But but we did the things that we believed would help him sleep. 
helped by someone who was a sleep nanny and it worked really well for him and he's a great sleeper. And because of that, I genuinely think he's a happy, well-balanced, uh, learns brilliantly. He's great at maths, um, mm. five-year-old. So, you know, I'd like to, that tiny little bit of evidence is all I need really to keep on, keep on, um, you know, preaching. Um. Well, I wish you all the success with it, Simon Knight. I think you you and your team are, are destined to be making some great headlines in the not too distant future. And um, one of the things that I do want to just touch back to the to the Vistra world, though, please, because you've been there less than a year. Yeah. Um, and and you mentioned earlier about potentially that you're being in acquisitive mode again. Um, but if you could just share with us maybe um what are your plans or, or visions for, for the future for your business or what have been the first things that you've tackled on your to-do list? Yeah, so I, 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 um, I, 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 when I left CPA, I, had, I, I wanted to, you know, I, I didn't think I'd be working again. And when I thought, well, I'm getting a bit restless, maybe I, maybe I do want to do some big stuff. I never thought I'd find another opportunity that was similar where we could genuinely sort of have an impact at an industry level. And funnily enough, the first thing I got off, uh, proposed to me was was this, and 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 the, and the opportunity is there. You know, we, there's, this is an industry, as I said, which is a terrific industry. It has a very wide ranging impact. It could best be described as kind of the investment execution life cycle. So that's from the moment either a, uh, a fund manager or a corporate enterprise decides to spend money for the purpose of doing something or investing in something. That the process of executing all the way along, and you know, there's all sorts of participants in that life cycle. Lawyers, as you well know, um, uh, accountants, kind of regulatory bodies, uh, all sorts of people. You know, pay you got to pay your employees. You've got to, you've got to, you know, you've got to um, be have an employee record um, so type sort of structures. There's all sorts of things that are needed uh, to make those things a reality. But they, but it's quite fragmented. It's a sort of ecosystem that still largely sort of works together in clumps around specific areas and we generally but genuinely believe that you know there's an opportunity to significantly improve or enhance the way that ecosystem works so so our vision really for the business you know we, we are we, we're you know we're, we're working hard at the moment on kind of uncovering as Caden put it uncovering our purpose but it is you know I've, I've sort of described that sort of investment execution life cycle as, as the process of progress, because it's through investment, really, that big things happen in the world. You know, we overcome climate change, we'll overcome pandemics, we'll, you know, deal, help to address poverty and inequality. Um, and that happens through investment and then investment that causes that progress. So we're, we're not the capital allocators. We don't we don't take the investment risk, but we are the execute. We are the execution side. So the process of progress is is what is is the process that we're involved with, in. and, and we we're sort of saying you know at the moment our working title is empowering the process of progress. So we're we're there to take friction out of the system so that those who do make those big investment decisions who are taking the risks they are never sort of put off or constrained by the thought of execution. We're making that as easy as possible for them. And by doing so, hopefully we can have an impact on investment and progress and the speed of it across the globe. Um, and, you know, the, the way in which we'll do that, the sort of um, the vision that we have for the business for that purpose is really to connect the ecosystem much more fully than it is today. So it's somewhat fragmented across multiple kind of areas and and we we are one of those areas we play a big part but we have an opportunity to connect up uh those ecosystem players into a much more coherent frictionless process for our clients the people who take the decision to invest uh, and pursue that progress that we so desperately need so so that's the kind of if you like the kind of aligning narrative that we're create that we're building at the moment um day the sort of immediate task is to is to complete our merger with Tricor, which is a very big 3,000 person business in Asia, Asia cha a regional champion really in Asia. That's really going to take up the rest of this year and, and, and a lot of and a big chunk of next. But alongside that, you know, crafting a new a, a refreshed narrative for our new organization as we come together and really sort of set, getting everyone aligned behind that is kind of job number one for the new CEO. Wow. Um, 
I know that you're going to succeed in that, Simon. So the, there's there's no need for me to wish you good luck, but I um I do wish you well with it. And um, we end every podcast with the same question, which is, what's the one thing you can't live without? Holy moly, um, my wife. <laughs> she, is, <laughs> she is. She's the. Uh, she is the. Um, she's the big enabling force behind whatever I do. I'd like to think I'm the same for her, but she probably wouldn't think so. But she is definitely that to me. So I will say my wife. Oh, well, Mrs. Webster, thank you very much. And to, to Mr. Webster, thank you. Thanks, Claire. Lovely to see you.